Hey everybody and welcome to Breaking Biotech. Thanks for being with me here today. My name is Matt and if you like the show you can help out by clicking the like or subscribe button. You can also donate using the Patreon link in the description below. So I'm glad to be back and I've got a great show for everybody today. We're going to be talking about geographic atrophy, also known as late stage dry AMD. I talked previously about wet AMD in a couple shows ago and I thought it would be useful to talk about dry AMD because of a number of different reasons. We've recently gotten some news from uh, some companies, one known as Gemini, where they saw basically a failure in their dry AMD candidate. And then we also have an upcoming readout from a company called Apellis in their candidate, and it's going to be pretty exciting for the space. So that's going to be our main story for today. And before I do that, I'm going to touch on some smaller biotech stories. And before we do that, I just want to thank everybody. I appreciate all the support I've been getting. So please keep it up. Please share the show with a friend if you think they'll appreciate this content. So with that, let's get right into it. And the first story I want to talk about is, of course, Biogen, my new favorite company. And they've just been in the news so much lately because of all the drama surrounding Aduhelm. And so after the big run-up they had, the stock is now back down to around $324 a share, giving them a market cap of around $49 billion. And a couple things that we heard in the last little while. The first one is that the FDA requested a label reduction of Aduhelm. And if you remember previously, it was a very broad label for anybody who had Alzheimer's disease. And then the FDA requested that Biogen reduce that label just to patients that were early stage Alzheimer's, which... For us, that doesn't really matter because I had modeled previously only those early stage Alzheimer's candidates being treated with Aduhelm because that's what the two phase three studies were looking at in particular. Now, the more dramatic news that we heard is that the acting FDA commissioner, Janet Woodcock, wrote a letter to the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Christy Grimm, asking for an investigation of Biogen's BLA approval. And what this is, is the FDA commissioner basically throwing the neurology department under the bus, saying that they need to be investigated for the approval of Biogen's BLA. And what Janet specifically cited are concerns over interactions between Biogen and the FDA that are inconsistent with FDA policies. And to me, I don't think we need to be too concerned about this unless there is a blatant uh, problem between the communication, but what I think this is, is the FDA trying to protect itself by saying, hey, we're doing all the due diligence we need to, to make sure that we're covering all our bases and there's nothing underhanded going on here. It does also make you wonder about the internal politics of the FDA, where Janet Woodcock feels comfortable throwing the neurology department under the bus like this. So we're going to see what happens. I think it is a buying opportunity because I assume what's going to happen is they're going to say that they did a thorough investigation and they found no real malice or they're going to fire a couple people in the FDA who may have spoken with Biogen uh, in an inconsistent manner with regard to FDA policies. But for them to have a communication that leads to pulling of the drug, I think that's a bridge too far. I've been buying on this dip. I'm down on the position overall, but this is a long term hold for me. The next company I want to talk about is ALX Oncology. And they are trading at around 55 bucks a share, giving them a market cap of 2.2 billion. And they recently announced new data in their second line or greater HER2 positive gastric cancer. And so the comparison from the previous data to the current data, their N number went from 14 to 18. The objective response rate went from 64 to 72.2, which is something you don't often see. Usually when you increase the patient population, the objective response rate tends to go down and I think generally the stock is priced in that way. So to see an improvement in the objective response rate, I think bodes very well for the treatment. And then they also mentioned that the progression's free survival was 9.1 months and the overall survival rate at 12 months is 75.8%. So like I mentioned, an improvement in the objective response I think is a very positive thing for this therapy in this indication. The stock did jump on the news, but it quickly sold off in the later days. So I don't know. The stock market with regards to the XBI in particular has been very, very bipolar, a lot of ups and downs. And I think this is just a buying opportunity for ALX. And I might add to my position given this data. Now, the one thing about it, though, is there aren't really a lot of readouts coming up for the back half of the year. The one that I think is going to be the most influential is this HNSCC with Keytruda, and that's going to be a phase one combination readout. 
And if it does show very positive data, I think the stock could move up on that news. But because it's a little thin in catalysts, I think that the stock might just hover around here until we get to 2022. Then the last story I want to touch on before we get to our feature is Hepion. And this company traded down 25% on this recent news. And they're sitting at around $1.50 per share, giving them a market cap of $130 million. And what they announced was positive top line data from their phase 2A ambition trial. And this is in Nash. And they said that all primary endpoints were achieved. Now, if you remember in December, Hepion announced some data from this trial, but it was early data. And what they said was that there was a measurable improvement in AST and ALT, two markers of liver damage that can be measured in the blood. These markers are generally a little bit higher in NASH patients because they have liver damage already. And then what Hepion announced is that both of these markers were reduced when they were treated with their drug that's supposed to help with NASH. Now what we're seeing today is an announcement of a change in ALT, but they totally omit AST. And when a company does that, it could be because the marker that they're not showing, in this case it's AST, showed a correlation that we didn't want to see, so the data is negative, or it happened to increase the amount of AST in the blood. But they didn't really mention it here, and they just showed us the change in ALT. And what we see here is the placebo is negative 6.1. With treatment group at 75 milligrams, we got negative 18.4. And then in the 225 milligram dose, we got negative 21.1. Another thing, though, that you'll notice is that the standard deviation here is very large. So we can see it says mean plus minus standard deviation. And for the placebo, the standard deviation is 13.3. The low dose is 25.8. And the high dose is 21.1. So in two of these three, the standard deviation on the percentage change is actually higher than the value itself. And what this means is that the data is extremely variable. And for this reason, I don't think we can glean any conclusion from the data. And the company's going to have to dig a lot deeper to figure out what's going on in this trial. And after this news came out, the stock did trade down quite a bit. And rightfully so. I think the company's going to have to show much more compelling data. And this is just in AST and ALT. These are liver damage markers broadly. They have nothing to do with NASH specifically. And one of the secondary endpoints of this trial, I believe, is some kind of fibro scan where they're going to actually look at the liver and see what's going on from a NASH perspective or a fibrosis perspective. So I'm very curious about what that data is going to show. I sold around 80% of my position at around $1.8 a share because I expected there was going to be further downside until we can see some kind of positive news with regards to the fiber scan or, or what's going on with these patients that led to such a drastically high standard deviation between the patients. So I don't think this is necessarily the nail in the coffin for CRV431. I think we're going to have to see the full data set and really figure out what's going on. Maybe the patient population was too variable. It, it really, it could be anything. And we need to find out once we see the data. With that, let's get to our main topic for today, which is dry AMD. And I showed this slide last time, which was just the ophthalmology sector. And I focused wholly last time on wet AMD or diabetic retinopathy. And the reason for this is that it's a $12 billion market as of 2020. And major players in here are generating a lot of revenue. ILEA generated $8.5 billion in 2020. Lucentis, $2 billion. And these drugs specifically target the wet form of AMD where the neovascularization is actually occurring and you're getting an increase of blood and protein underneath the retina, which is causing a lot of problems. Now, dry AMD is a stage prior to the wet AMD stage. And it's also known as geographic atrophy. I think the geographic atrophy distinction is that it is later stage dry AMD because Dry AMD is a very long process, and when it's very early, there's no symptoms, and you don't really know what's going on, but the lesion might be very, very small, or it could be getting bigger. And so geographic atrophy is when there's actually some kind of symptomology, and you're at least being monitored by an ophthalmologist. And so the interesting thing about dry AMD is that it makes up 90% of the AMD market. So this $12 billion that wet AMD garnered in 2020 is only 10% of the whole AMD market. 
So for this reason, there's a huge opportunity to jump into dry AMD and try to get a therapy on the market because as of now, there's no standard of care. And it really takes until getting to the wet AMD stage where doctors can go ahead with some kind of treatment, Lucentis, Ilea, or Avastin. Now, the curious thing with dry AMD is that the mechanism is not well understood. The way it's been described is that cell debris or fat deposits called drusen accumulate between the retina and the choroid, leading to retinal atrophy. Eventually, it leads to retinal pigmentosum epithelial cell death, and then you get blindness eventually. So it is a progressive disease that leads to pretty serious consequences, and it's for this reason that a treatment would really help patient outcomes. Like I mentioned, there's no standard of care, but the complement pathway is a primary target. A number of companies have focused on this, and there's been a ton of failures in the space, but we're starting to see a lot of potential with specific complement inhibitors that are able to see some improvement in lesion development. To talk briefly about the complement cascade, and I'm not going to do this in any serious detail, I'm going to talk really about the things that matter to us. And the way this works is there's a classic pathway, a lectin pathway, and an, and an alternative pathway. And through each one of these pathways, the major hub molecule known as complement 3 or C3 is cleaved into C3B. And now this C3B can go into a classical pathway or an alternative pathway that leads to a positive feedback loop. The classical pathway is C3B associating with other complement factors to cleave C5 or complement 5, and this forms a membrane attack complex with other complement factors, and this leads to pores being formed into the pathogen that leads to an eventual death of that pathogen because the osmotic pressure changes in a way that allows the cell to lyse. So that's the classic pathway. The alternative pathway is a positive feedback loop where C3B associates with complement factor B as well as properdin, and this will bind to pathogens as well as host cells to further cleave C3 into C3B, and this leads to a big, big signal that promotes this complement pathway. Now, obviously, if this binds to host cells, we're going to get problems because it's going to lead to degradation of our host cells, but Interestingly, these other complement factors known as complement factor H and complement factor I, they bind to the host cell and are involved in quenching that reaction only on host cells. So in this way, CFH and CFI are very important to dampen the complement 3 effects. The other thing I wanted to mention is complement factor D is very important for activating complement factor B. And this is important because this molecule here failed in clinical trials known as lampolizumab. And so in that alternative positive feedback loop pathway, complement factor D is very important to help with complement factor B. And so without getting into too much more detail than that, the reason why the complement cascade is such an important thing in AMD is that when you knock out C3, Mice did not develop choroidal neovascularization after laser photocoagulation, which usually elicits neovascularization in the choroid. So researchers then went on to test this in non-human primates, and they found that this is kind of a viable pathway for treating macular degeneration. So given that, a lot of companies have tried to intervene in this pathway to stop the progress of AMD. The one that I just mentioned is lampolizumab, and this is a phase three failure in 2017. It targets the inhibition of complement factor D. So what they're hoping to do here going back is to target complement factor D. We're not gonna get cleavage of complement factor B, and therefore we're gonna dampen the C3B activity because it won't be able to associate with complement factor B, which it needs to. So that molecule unfortunately did fail, Another company, Gemini Therapeutics, recently had a failure in Q2 with their recombinant factor H in CFH variant enriched population that had dry AMD. And so we see here, if we go back, that trying to put more complement factor H into patients, that is also going to dampen the C3 response because seemingly if you're deficient in CFH, you're probably getting more C3B activity on the host cells, 
and if you can increase the amount of CFH, presumably you can improve that. But unfortunately, this led to a failure, and we're going to talk more about that in a second. Then just to go through a couple others, Alcon Research, Novartis, Alexion tried their molecule Solaris in GIMD, and that also led to a failure. I want to move on and talk about some companies that are kind of up-and-comers in the space. The early ones are Catalyst Bio, Gemini Therapeutics, as well as Ionis. And then ones that are much further along in development that I think are interesting is Iveric Bio as well as Apellus Pharma. Now, you can see here the range in market caps are pretty dramatic. Catalyst Bio and Gemini Therapeutics are around 100 to $200 million market cap, whereas Ionis, Iveric, and Apellus are all a $1 billion or up to $5 billion in their market cap. And there's a number of reasons on why this is, and I'll talk about this in more detail, but the specific companies I want to focus on are Catalyst Bio, Gemini, Ionis, as well as Apellus. So let's do that now. First company I want to touch on is Catalyst Bio, ticker symbol CBIO. They have a market cap of around $135 million today. Their current cash sits at $115 million with $15 million in current liabilities, and they burn an average of around $20 million per quarter. So this gives them an enterprise value of only $35 million. And there's a number of reasons on why I think this is, but the company previously focused on hemophilia assets that were able to improve different kinds of hemophilic disorders. I don't really want to talk about that too much because their future really looks like it's going to be in complement pathway inhibitors. They entered into a collaboration with Biogen for their anti-C3 portfolio in Q4 of 2019. And the main molecule that they were talking about then was this one called CB2782. And this is a complement 3 degrader. And it's also attached to PEG, which is able to increase the half-life of the molecule in the body for quite a long time. And what they're showing here in a non-human primate model is that when they inject their inhibitor CB2782 PEG, they're able to get reduction in C3 concentration for you know, upwards of 40 to 50 days before another injection is going to have to be given. And what they're marketing this as is a molecule that won't need to be injected monthly. And as we know with wet AMD, the real push in that sector is to try and reduce the number of injections. So Catalyst Bio is a little bit ahead of the curve in that way in that they're already thinking about a molecule that will work for anti-C3 and also not need very many injections. Now the one issue is with CB2782, there has been minimal progress since this collaboration with Biogen started. We're going on almost two years here and this figure that I'm showing here on the right was just presented again at their Complement R&D Day in July, like on Monday this week. So my one caution for people who are taking a position is that this company is notoriously slow in development and for this reason they really need to raise a lot of money and it is what has hampered the stock price from going much further than say eight, nine dollars over the last couple of years. Now, the one thing the company did mention is that they're looking into different kinds of complement factor pathway molecules. And one that they mentioned is CB4332. And to my knowledge, this is relatively new. And what they're hoping to do here is to restore CFI, complement factor I, which inhibits that positive feedback loop pathway that I was talking about before. So they're trying to restore CFI in order to dampen the complement 3B pathway, thus hopefully improving the patient outcomes associated with dry AMD. Now this is also very early in development, so we'll see whether or not we get some newer data before the end of the year. And then just to talk about the financials of it, Catalyst received a $15 million upfront payment for this collaboration with Biogen, and they're eligible to receive $340 million in milestone payments. So I encourage everybody to look at the complement R&D day that they had on Monday. It was a lot of preclinical data, and you know they had some physician talking about how important the complement pathway is, but for me, the company is extremely slow, and for this reason, their stock price is given at a discount here. Now, if they ever do get to releasing that big data point that's gonna show that these factors actually work, I think then it does make sense that to take a position, but for me right now, because the company 
is so slow in development and I did kind of get burned on them before, I am staying away. Moving on though, let's talk about Gemini Therapeutics. They're trading at around a $220 million market cap with $188 million in current assets, $14 million in current liabilities, and they also burn around $20 million per quarter. Their enterprise value is sitting at around $46 million, and the reason for this is due to a recent failure that they saw in dry AMD. Their focus is on the AMD market as a whole, so they have some programs in wet AMD and some in dry AMD, but their lead candidate is GEM103, which is a recombinant factor H, and this was recently treated in a variant population that had a mutation in complement factor H, and they also had dry AMD. So Gemini posited that if they could reintroduce normal physiologic levels of complement factor H, they might be able to slow down the lesion formation in the eyes of patients that have dry AMD. The companies also touched on gene therapies that they're hoping to develop. They're specifically doing ones for complement factor H and complement factor I. And as we know, I do have kind of a love affair with gene therapies, so this caught my eye. But what we saw in Q2 was that they got a pretty strong failure in their Regatta Phase 2A study. And so these patients were on six months worth of treatment of GEM103, which is that recombinant factor H. And the data, the most impactful data is what's shown here on the right. And what this is showing is a change in the size of the lesion between the GEM103 study eye and the fellow eye, both of them that had dry AMD, but one was receiving the drug and the other one was not. And we see here basically no change at six months. Now, the company says they're seeking alignment with regulators, but this is pretty much a renowned failure in the study, so I'm not really sure how we're going to move forward. Maybe the time point is too short at six months, but... I think at six months, if we're not seeing an effect, there probably isn't one waiting for us. The company's also testing this in neovascular AMD or wet AMD, and that's going to be a Q4 readout. And depending where the stock is at that point, this could be a shorting opportunity given that they weren't able to see any data here. But I have no plans to trade the company in the short term. Now, the one thing I did mention is the AAV program where they're hoping to do constructs that are amenable to an intravitreal injection, and they're gonna nominate and develop candidates in the second half of 2021. They're hoping to submit the IND in 2022 and then start with these studies. But I gotta say, they need to understand why the studies in dry AMD with GEM 103 were a failure. And it could be that CFH just isn't a viable target for these patients and that there's something else going on in the complement pathway that needs to be addressed before CFH can be useful in slowing the progress of dry AMD lesions. The other thing I wanted to mention here is that this figure that I'm highlighting on the right is in their appendix for their corporate presentation and they show here uh, CFH levels in nanograms per milliliter sitting at, the, at around 100 to 200 nanograms per mil. Now, when I went to the literature, it seems like the average or like the reference range for plasma CFH is between, say, 300 and 600 micrograms per mil. So I wonder if this is just a typo where this NG per mL should be UG per mL or, or mu G per mL so that it's the right units. But otherwise, it means that their patients have a thousand times less CFH in their plasma. The other thing that I could be mistaking about this is where they took these samples. If these are like intravitreal samples, they might have a lot less CFH than uh, plasma CFH. So I'm not too sure there, but I did want to point this out that this is a little bit weird. And then the other thing I wanted to share about this data in particular, and I'm blowing up one of the images, is that some of the studies I looked at showed that the difference between patients that have AMD and controls in the plasma CFH is only about 20 micrograms per mil. The control group had around 430 micrograms per mil and the AMD group was reduced down to around 410 or 420. So the reason why I wanna bring this up is that because that delta is only so small, the window for opportunity and treatment makes me feel like this might not be the best target to go after. Because if you can increase the amount of plasma CFH to the control level, you're really only increasing that level by less than 1%. And I just can't imagine that that much CFH 
is going to be enough to overcome the problems with lesion development in dry AMD. Now, this is just one study, so I want to caveat that, that, you know, it could be that this is a study population that happened to have pretty close levels of plasma CFH and that they could be more dramatic in the, the real world. So for me, this makes it a little bit uncertain on Gemini's future, but I really hope that they're able to dive deeply into this and figure out exactly why Gem 103 has been a failure to date. With that, let's move on to Ionis, and they are trading at a $5 billion market cap. They sit at $2.2 billion in total assets with $1.6 billion in total liabilities. I use total liabilities and assets here because the company is pretty big and they have a lot of different factors that play into their financials, so I think it's relevant to look at total versus current. Using these numbers, we get an enterprise value of $4.4 billion. And the reason why they've garnered such a high value is that they're pretty much a leader in anti-sense technologies. They have a number of approved drugs and they have a very large pipeline. A couple of notable mentions here, Spinraza, which I've talked about in the past, is a Biogen collaboration. And this drug has been approved since 2016. And then another molecule that's gonna have a very important phase three readout in 2021 is a compound called Tofersen, I think that's called. So that's another Biogen collaboration and they're trying to treat ALS patients with this. So this is gonna be a pretty big readout for both Ionis and Biogen and I'm gonna be looking forward to that. But the reason why I'm bringing them up here is because they have a ligand conjugated investigational antisense medicine whereby they're trying to reduce the production of complement factor B in patients with dry AMD. So let's go back to our trusty diagram here, and so they're trying to reduce complement factor B, which if you remember, is important to complex with C3B in order to do the positive feedback loop that leads to an overproduction of complement factor activity in order to really you know, influence pathogens that are involved in whatever is causing the complement activation. So we saw previously that lampalizumab, which was C complement factor D was a failure, but Ionis is trying to target something further downstream, which is complement factor B. And if they can reduce the levels of complement factor B successfully, hopefully that'll lead to a dampening of the complement three activity, and therefore lead to less of the deleterious overproduction of this pathway. What they've done so far is a safety pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic study of Ionis FB LRX, that's the name of the drug. And so this is a phase one study that was masked. It was placebo controlled where they did single and multiple ascending doses in 54 healthy volunteers. And so what they've seen here, and this was presented at some conference, but I found something that was recent in June, 2020, where they showed that they reduced factor B levels in a dose dependent manner by approximately 56% and 72% after 36 days of multiple subcutaneous administrations of 10 milligrams and 20 milligrams respectively. So it looks here like they're getting effectiveness. They did measure a couple other biomarkers, but to me, this is just, this is validating enough. And the next step is we really wanna see some efficacy in patients that have dry AMD. Gladly, they also said that there were no safety signals or clinically relevant changes in blood chemistry, hematology, urinalysis, ECG or vital signs. So the safety so far looks pretty good and presumably they, they're gonna pick a dose that they're gonna use for their phase two trial. And so they say here that based on these data, an adapted design masked placebo controlled phase two trial in patients having geographic atrophy associated with AMD was initiated to determine whether Ionis FB LRX can reduce the geographic atrophy area growth rate over 12 months. And so this is called the Golden Study, and you can see the NCT number here. And they're gonna be doing 330 patients in a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled study. And they've adapted a design in which three dose levels are gonna be evaluated in a subset of patients for stage one. They're gonna do an interim analysis, and then the number of patients in two of the dose cohorts will be expanded in stage two. So I'm thinking we're gonna see some kind of interim analysis, and that might be the readout that we're expecting in 2022. Now, Ionis has a number of molecules already on the market, and like I said, they have a huge pipeline. So for me, I'm, I need to do more work on Ionis to figure out what's going on with them in more of their near-term catalyst. But for me, I think it's totally plausible that this could be a positive readout, and I'm gonna be looking to seeing whether or not 2022 makes sense to add some kind of position, because they've recently seen 
a number of successes in a number of their different programs. All right, now the final company I want to talk about today is a company known as Apellis Pharma. Their ticker symbol is APLS. They're trading at around a $5 billion market cap. They have $510 million in total assets with $760 million in total liabilities, including their debt, and they burn around $150 million per quarter. This gives them an enterprise value of around $5 billion, and they're commercializing and developing a molecule called Pegsatacoplan, and this is a molecule that binds to complement protein C3 and its activation fragment C3B. So if we go back to our uh, list of companies that failed prior, we see here that some of them were just C3 inhibitors. And what Apellis might be doing that is stronger than some previous companies is that they're not just targeting C3, but they're also targeting the effector molecule C3B. So all that complement that has been turned into C3B is also going to be inhibited by Apellis's molecule. So it's gonna be more strong than some of the previous ones potentially, which in my opinion could lead to either more side effects but greater efficacy. It is this push and pull when it comes to different molecules and how strong you wanna go. But this company has seen some recent successes with this molecule in different indications. And on May 14th of this year, Apellis announced FDA approval of Empavelli which is their molecule Pegsatacoplan, and this is treatment for adults with paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria. And if you know anything about this disease in particular, you'll know that a company known as Alexion has had a molecule on the market for quite a while treating this rare disease. And the compound that they've developed is called Solaris, and the revenue for Solaris in 2020 was $4 billion, and they've also generated another compound that does a similar thing called Ultomyris, I think you say that, and that generated $1 billion in 2020. So the approval of this molecule for PNH is what led to a pretty big increase in Apellis's valuation to date, and Apellis is also looking in a number of different indications. They're looking in rare diseases, ALS, CAD, as well as another one called uh, C3G or ICMPGN, and look at their corporate presentation for more detail. They, these aren't the programs that I'm most interested in today. For me, it's really the ophthalmology sector where they're looking to treat geographic atrophy, and they have top line phase three results coming in September of this year. They're also going to be looking at intermediate AMD, and this is the intersection of geographic atrophy and wet AMD, and they're going to be initiating a phase three trial in 2022 for that based off of the results that they see in this phase three trial. Now, before I talk about the phase three, we have to go over the phase two results and the trial is named the Philly trial. Basically, they were able to see an improvement in the geographic atrophy lesion size in their phase two trial. They got a decrease of 20% and 29% depending on the frequency of injection. They did a monthly and a bi-monthly or every other month injection. And in both of these cases, they saw a pretty nice improvement in the size of the geographic atrophy lesion. When they looked at visual acuity, they saw no difference. And to me, this isn't a big deal. The lesions in geographic atrophy might not be on the part of the visual field that's actually going to affect BCVA. If the lesion is not in that fovea in particular, there's not gonna be any difference in BCVA until the lesion gets big enough where it's actually gonna cover the fovea. So, here, we see no difference between the groups, but the lesion size can still be decreasing or increasing less in the patients treated with the molecule, and it's still doing something that's clinically relevant for the patient. So for me, this isn't a big deal, but it is notable. Now, the problematic thing with the Philly trial is the adverse events. And if we see here in the slide, the adverse events were definitely imbalanced from the monthly group, the every other month group, compared to the sham pooled group. The systemic SAEs were balanced between the group, but then if we look at specifically treatment-related ocular adverse events in the study eye, the monthly group saw 25.6%, the every other month group saw 13.9%, and the sham group saw zero. So something is clearly going on with this treatment that's not happening in the sham pooled group. And if we look at the severe adverse events, the ones that pop out Three patients that received Pegsatacoplan, or APL2 as it's listed here, saw serious adverse event of endophthalmitis, and this is an infection in the eye. And they say here specifically what the bacteria was. And to me, this is a pretty small number of patients that saw this. 
Now, maybe there's an increased risk of bacterial infection due to the fact that we're inhibiting the complement pathway, but I would say that this is pretty positive given it's only three patients out of so many that were looked at. Another SAE that came up was increased ocular pressure. That happened in two patients, but because it was such a few number of patients compared to zero in the sham, I don't think this is a big deal. And then the third big SAE that came out was a retinal detachment in the APL2 group that was given monthly injections. And for me, the retinal detachment is kind of interesting because usually I associate that with the injection method, but these were all done intravitreally, which in general, compared to say subretinal, has a lower percent chance of developing a retinal detachment, even though it obviously is possible and it happened here. But what I would want the company to look at is see whether or not these adverse events happened in the same clinical site. And maybe some doctor might not be great at doing intravitreal injections, and it led to some kind of bacterial infection, as well as potentially this retinal detachment. But the company doesn't dive into that in any more detail. So for us, we can't really make any conclusion one way or another, but a retinal detachment to me makes it seem like something was going on in this clinical center or the person that was administering this drug. Of course, we really don't know, so I'm only speculating. But leaving that all aside, the one thing that is notable here is that of the adverse events that happen in these patients, 20% and 10% in the monthly or the every other month group developed wet AMD in the study eye. Now, this is very curious because what we're hoping to do is prevent dry AMD, and for some reason, 20% and 10% of patients end up developing wet AMD. So what the company did is they looked at the number of patients that had a history of choroidal neovascularization in the non-study eye, and they found that in the monthly group, there were 36 patients, in the every other month group, there were 28 patients, and in the sham pooled group, there were 29 patients. And so of those, the percentage of patients that had wet AMD in the study eye were 36% in the monthly group and around 20% in the every other month group with zero in the sham pooled group. So what they're saying here is that the presence of wet AMD in the study eye correlated very highly to patients that happen to have a history of choroidal neovascularization in the untreated eye. And so they do the corollary of that, which is the number of patients that have no CNV history in the fellow eye, and of the patients that have no history of CNV in the fellow eye, there were 10% who were treated with the monthly dose that had wet AMD, 4% in the every other month dose that had wet AMD, and then 2% in the shampoo group. So for some reason, patients that have a history of CNV in the fellow eye are more susceptible to getting wet AMD after being treated with APL2. And this is very weird. So I went on to find a study that looked in greater detail on really what was going on in the study because it's a pretty weird outcome. And the authors concluded that the current study identified two well-known factors that seem to predispose the study eyes to the development of EAMD or wet AMD. The first one was the presence of EAMD in the fellow eye, which is what the trial, the company said before, and two, a double layer sign in the study eye. They go on to say, though, that taken together, these findings provide a phenotypic rationale for higher than expected rate of new onset exudation, but do not fully explain the imbalance between the active and sham control arms. Because in general, they said that the presence of EAMD and the double layer sign were pretty equal in the different groups. The authors then go on to say that it is possible that the single mass nature of the Philly trial could have led to some overreporting, as evident by patients without evidence of new neovascularizations on FA at the time of EAMD diagnosis. And FA refers to fluorescein angiography. This is a way of seeing whether or not there are exudations in the eye of these patients. So what the authors are saying here is that because it was a single blinded trial, meaning that only the doctor who was administering the treatment knew whether or not the patient was actually getting the treatment or not, led to an overreporting of wet AMD because the doctors knew that if the patient was receiving this treatment, maybe they were paying more attention to whether or not there was going to be some wet AMD presence in these patients. I think it's a bit of a stretch, though, because you wouldn't expect a treatment for dry AMD to lead to wet AMD, but maybe because they started to see earlier patients that came through start to get wet AMD, that they were then looking for it. And that's kind of what they're arguing here, I believe. So let's get to the phase three trials. And so one thing that Apellus stands behind is that 
they are not changing the setup of the trial compared to the phase two trial. There are a couple of differences though. One is that it's placebo controlled and double blinded. And because it's double blinded, they're hoping that this is going to uh, improve the amount of safety reports that happen in the treatment group versus the sham group, which they attribute to the imbalance in safety outcomes that happen in the Philly trial. There's going to be an N of 600 patients in each trial at 100 multinational sites over two years' time. The primary endpoint is the total change in GA lesions in the area in particular. And so it's a little bit different than the phase two study, but for our purposes, it won't really matter. They were able to see a change in the total area in the phase two trial as well. And the company is expecting to see top line data in September of this year. And so going back to the paper, I took a few things that came out where they're talking about the phase three study that I think were interesting. The first thing is that no adjustment to the study enrollment criteria was made to the subsequent phase three clinical trial at Derby and Oaks. Those are the names of the trials. Second thing is that these studies are double masked and they also have processes in place to corroborate new onset exudations to eliminate any potential bias. So because they're looking now for exudative AMD, they have some processes in place to be able to assess what's going on better than they did in the Philly trial. And to do that, they, they're implementing a couple new things. And in three, I have that here. It is a requirement that fluorescein angiography is performed at the time of any patient being suspected of having wet AMD and reading center confirmation of exudative AMD is to be obtained at the time of diagnosis. So they didn't do this before, so now they're gonna be able to implement this greater analysis of wet AMD, and hopefully we'll be able to shed more light on what's going on with the patients. And then in four here, I have that unlike in the Philly trial, should patients receive anti-VEGF treatment, double masking will be maintained, and they will continue to receive treatment with peg plan or sham as determined by the randomized arm. So in this study, they're gonna do the best they can to maintain double masking so that they're not influenced by any kind of bias as determined by the randomized arm. So that's gonna be the hope and hopefully they're gonna be able to influence the number of safety outcomes that occur as compared to the Philly trial. So overall, dry AMD presents a massive opportunity that could easily rival wet AMD in revenue and even surpass it in only a few years. Apelis and Iberic, I think, are the clear leaders, but others are quickly developing molecules in other parts of the complement pathway that might see success. I also want to mention here that Catalyst, Bio, and Gemini present a very favorable return risk ratio because of their low enterprise value, but with this comes a reduced chance of success than the two above, which I say here are Apelis and Iberic. And the reasons for this is that Catalyst Bio, I think, is very slow at developing their pipeline. And Gemini has an unvalidated molecule here. We don't know if reintroducing CFH is a good method to treat wet or dry AMD. So until either of them can overcome these obstacles, I think that it's going to be tough for them to overcome that low enterprise value. But right now, the risk reward is definitely in the favor of a long position. Now, I wanted to mention a couple of trade ideas. The one that I think is the best chance of success is Apelis. And the reason for this is that between now and September, you have a chance of taking a position, either long or short, before the Derby and Oaks phase three top line readout. Now, I think that efficacy is going to be comparable to the Philly phase two trial. I don't think we should expect any problem with efficacy and that it's priced in at this point. The one risk is gonna be on safety. And I think that the base case right now would lead to about a 20% increase. And the base case is better safety outcomes than the Philly trial. And the reason for this is the company's been very vocal on what they've done to reduce the bias that was seen in the Philly trial. And I mentioned here one example is the double masking. And they're also going to be implementing these processes to monitor EAMD better than they did in the phase two study. So I think that the base case is that the safety has to be better than the Philly trial. If it's not better than the Philly trial or it's in line with the Philly trial, I think we could see about a decrease in 30% of the stock price and where it's trading at before the readout comes out. And then the bull case, I see an increase of around 40% potential. And this would be safety that's significantly better than the Philly trial. Maybe there's no imbalance in any of the arms with regards to the wet AMD. So it remains to be seen, but I think that 
Potentially, it is worth taking a long position before the readout, but the company I've noticed this week is trading a lot higher than the $5 billion market cap already. So as we increase that market cap, I think it's going to be difficult for me to justify a position. So I'm gonna assess as we get later into August on whether or not I'm gonna take a position, but I think that it has a very good possibility of having nice safety as well as efficacy. Now, one other trade idea that you could do is that because Catalyst Bio has a complement three as well, and it might be able to be given in a less frequent dose than Apellus, on positive Apellus news, it could trade higher. But I caution against doing this trade because I'm probably biased in my opinion of Catalyst because they've been unable to deliver on a lot of their prior programs that I just think that they're going to drag their feet on their complement molecules like they have for their uh, hemophilia assets. And I would not expect that any gains that are derived from a positive Apellus readout are going to last very long for Catalyst Bio. So those are a couple of trade ideas. Now, since Q2 is over, there's a lot of stuff coming up in Q3. The one that is going to be a huge mover for the CNS space is the Alzheimer's Association International Conference, also known as the AAIC. It's happening between July 26th and the 30th, and we're going to be seeing updates from Cassava, Elector, Anovis, as well as a number of other CNS companies. And because they've garnered such huge valuations, I think that these are going to be huge movers, whether or not the data is good or bad. The other stuff we can expect are Q2 earnings that should be coming out. I'm going to be looking a lot at uh, Biogen. We have data coming out from Atrica, Regenix Bio and Clearside, Cariofarm, BTAI, Hepion, Replimune, and Curis in particular. To do a quick portfolio wrap up, I'm sitting at around negative 10 year to date. The last couple weeks have been totally disastrous for my portfolio, along with I think a lot of other people who are in the biotech sector. The one notable trade I want to mention is that I sold 400 shares of Hepion at 181, uh, increasing my cash position by around $700, and I haven't really executed that anywhere. I am thinking about adding to ALX Oncology like I mentioned. And I'm going to think about doing some kind of dry AMD play as we get closer to September, if it makes sense. And like I said, a lot can change between now and September. So I'm going to be watching Apellus's price and seeing whether or not it makes sense to go long or short. Like I mentioned, the biotech sector as a whole has been totally crushed. We can see a huge divergence here between uh, ARCG, IBB, and XBI compared to the NASDAQ, Dow Jones, as well as the S&P 500. Now, things have recovered a bit since then, so I would expect the next presentation I do to look a lot better, but unfortunately, we've been seeing a lot of bearish activity in the biotech sector, and hopefully some M&A can occur that will turn this train around and we can see those beautiful profits that we're hoping for. So with that, I'm going to wrap it up, but I want to thank everybody for your attention. I appreciate all of the feedback I get. Let me know what you think. Leave me a comment, hit the like button, and please subscribe to the channel. It does help me out. So with that, thank you everybody, and we'll see you next time.